Our second scripture reading is from Psalm 118, 1 through 2, and 14 through 24. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter in through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Woohoo! Okay, so we're celebrating today because, you know, God, God did it! <laughs> all that we hoped for, all that we dared even hope for beyond our wildest imagination. Um, this is a day of joy and of victory beyond what we could have ever expected. But it didn't start out that way. So step back a couple paces to enjoy this resurrection hallelujah moment with me. Um, and, and I want to go back to Palm Sunday and the entry into Jerusalem and Jesus and the disciples. Because this psalm that we just read was what was used liturgically when a king rode back in from victory. And so it's actually a dialogue that includes the priests the king and the people. So the priest started it out, right? Because we always like to ask everybody to remember God's steadfast love for forever. That's kind of our gig. Um, and so then the king's recounting his victories and what has happened. And then the priests are bringing him in literally into the gates um, of righteousness. And, and the king is saying then at the end, this is um, the Lord who has become my salvation, right? The Corner, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then it's all the people that respond. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our sight. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And so if you think of this psalm and think of the parade that just happened with shouts of Hosanna, God save us, and the palm branches, like Peter was ready. Like, this was a good moment. Everything was lining up. And the way I understand Peter's feeling is that way back, um, almost a couple decades now, um, I was a camp counselor. And there was a hand-in-hand -hand camp going on, which meant all the camper um, had parents and grandparents with them. And I had just um, finished leading a worship service. And there was this one parent that, um, you know, was a little troublesome and um, always nettling and um, was bothering me at this point about, you know, when are we going to eat? Who's going to get this fire? started was our big campfire moment and how's this gonna go and I was like I've got it sir I'm getting the fire started there are games over here he's like you're doing the fire at which point every feminist button in my body was like mm-hmm um, and so he kept an eye on me and I go to start the fire <laughs> one match oh yeah <laughs> and he saw it oh this satisfaction, guys, that was almost two decades ago, and I still feel it. It was awesome. It was a great moment. That is the Peter moment that he's expecting, right? All the crowds have come in. All the taunts, all the ridicule, all the leaders that they have gone through, this is going to be the one-match moment that sets the record straight. And they are going to be there for it. And Jesus is going to ride in and he's going to be the Messiah that they were hoping for and waiting for. And everything is going to fall into its proper place. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't. 
Because even when the guards come and arrest him, and in the story according to John, when Jesus says, I am, the guards fall down in fear. Like That's the moment, right? Peter's ready. He draws his sword. He strikes the chief priest servant ear. He is ready to start the revolution. And then he gets chastised. And Jesus turns himself over. Not the one match moment. <laughs> Not the exciting God, you did it, fireworks, yes, victory. What is going on? And I think this psalm gives us a clue. Because we want that cornerstone moment. We don't want the rejection moment. Who does? But before the stone can become the cornerstone, it's rejected. And I don't know what it is about life or the mystery, but there is a transformation that happens in our most broken and in our most vulnerable points that just doesn't happen any time else. And so in this story, we hit this low point where Peter, with all of his bravado and gusto, with all of his determination to never leave Jesus' side, bails. And then tries to correct it real fast and then does end up going back to the gates after Jesus is arrested and the other disciple gets him in, but then repeatedly denies ever having known Jesus or having any part of him. And the cock crows, and it's not a good day. And so today we find them huddled in a room and grieving because their whole world has unraveled and disintegrated and they don't know who they are anymore and they don't know what they stand for and they don't know what happened. I get Peter's tunnel vision too. There is a time um, in my professional life where there was this crisis that happened and I was mortified to the point where I lined up all of the records and documentation that I could and went to my boss's boss because this injustice had to be corrected and it had to be confronted and it had to be dealt with. And I knew that I had every piece in place. Did I? And was I at the meeting where the very injustice I was decrying was voted on? Yeah. I found the minutes later on and had to write then the apology email, right, of, of being wrong and owning that. The most terrifying part, I have no memory of what was shared at that meeting. It's right there in the minutes that I found in my file. I have no memory of that conversation happening, but it was there. When Jesus went to wash Peter's feet and Peter rejected, like, no, you're not gonna take that role with me, absolutely not. And Jesus says, well, then you can't have any part of me. And then Peter says, okay, it was there. Jesus' teachings on his dying, on his suffering, were there. But Peter couldn't hear them, couldn't understand them. And I hadn't either. I completely missed a really critical key point of information that I didn't see until I was broken, until I had to own my failure and my part, until my bottom dropped out of my world and everything unraveled. Those are the really hard, scary moments of life. But they're also where the resurrection and the Easter magic can happen. Because what Peter did get right was that his fate was entwined with Jesus's. That if Jesus went down and was arrested that night, things wouldn't go well for him. He knew that piece. But what he couldn't imagine and what he didn't know was a different plan. Was a plan that would bring life and would entwine him in that life and give him that chance. And that's what happens 
but it takes a while to work through that dark hole of rejection and having our world disintegrate and fall apart around us. Because when we come to this scripture of Peter and the other disciple running to the tomb, because now Mary says the body isn't there and what's happening, the other disciple goes in and scripture tells us believes. He puts the pieces together. We know that Peter goes in, but scripture is silent on Peter's belief. And how could Peter believe in that moment? How could Peter find good news in that moment? He had bailed. If Jesus really was back, that was not good news for Peter because how could he actually live into being Simon Peter, the rock on which Jesus would build his church when he ran and denied at the very crucial moment that Jesus needed him? Of course Jesus would reject him and Jesus would be right to do so. But that's not how the story goes. There's a meal on a beach, and there's a moment of redemption in which Jesus and Peter have a conversation, and Jesus asks Peter if Peter loves him. And in that grace and in that clarity and in that understanding is also a call for what to do with that. Yes, I love you. Then feed my sheep. Jesus redeems the failure and makes Peter once again the rock, the cornerstone on which Jesus will build the church. And what I would suggest to us today is that I don't think Peter could have been that rock without this experience. I don't think Peter would have known the fullness of what resurrection is without this experience. I don't know that there would have been room in Peter's world for God's truth to break through his own without this experience. Because as well-intentioned and as well-meaning as we are, we are the creatures. We are not the creator. And so we will always have a limited understanding. And it is in the times where we come to the limits of that limited understanding and finally realize that we can't do it on our own, that we don't have all the pieces, that we are in fact part of the problem at times, whether we mean to or not. There's not as much room for God to work or to break through in an alleluia and in a praise. And so in this moment is the Easter moment of redemption. And words just don't describe it, right? I mean, I can tell you and stand up here all day and sharing the difference between operating from who we are and our best intentions and good work being done from that versus what it means and the depth that comes when we get out of the way and let God work through us. But we're never going, words are never going to do it justice until we experience it. And that is my Easter prayer for all of us at no matter what stage of this faith journey we are in or not, that God may have the moments to break into our lives. Because what I do know is that if there hasn't been yet, there absolutely will be times in our life when we are crushed and beaten down and when we just can't go anymore. And I also know, and maybe this is a thing of privilege or not, I don't know, but I do have the experience of being harder on myself than anyone else would be to me and feeling unworthy and feeling inadequate and feeling like a failure that can't be used. But if we are able to put that understanding and that feeling in God's hands, then there can be a resurrection and there can be a transformation that will bring about a power and a glory that is phenomenal. Because as satisfying as those one match moments are, and don't get me wrong, I still love my one match moment. Maybe Jesus will work on me enough to the point where I can give that up a little bit. But I know the depth that has come from that moment of owning my mistake and my blindness and making more room for God to work.
And quite frankly, that one more moment, that one vulnerable, scary, embarrassing moment opened more power and more depth and more possibility to me in understanding what faith is about and what God is about than a thousand one match moments could ever do. In Acts chapter 10, God comes in a vision to Peter, asking him to take and eat of all kinds of animals that are unclean. And Peter's like, no way. I know this one. I'm not going to get tricked. I'm good. Never has anything unclean passed my lips before. Nope, don't worry. I'm not going to take and eat. And God is like, yes, take and eat. And do not call unclean what I have made clean. And no sooner does that vision end then Peter is asked to go with the um, uh, messengers that have been sent to him to baptize Cornelius, not just a Gentile, a Roman (laughs) centurion who's part of the oppression, who's part of the problem. And this time, Peter never hesitates for a second, but he is there because he's had his moment of rejection. He's had his moment of failure And he's had his moment of redemption. And he has a body, soul memory of what it is like for God's truth to break his own. And he instantly recognizes it now and goes. And let me tell you, there's an awesome church council meeting after that. And we can read about that later. And by awesome, I mean it makes ours look really good. But Peter stays the course and testifies and holds the church through one of the very first controversies that look to tear it apart of whether or not the Gentiles are left in to this Jesus movement. We stand here today giving lots of thanks for Peter's strength and testimony and for being the rock in that time and for making sure, along with Paul, that the church stayed open to the Gentiles and that that beginning of inclusion was set. So may we all give ourselves over to the Easter work of God because I know of nothing else that the world needs more right now than the hope and the good news that failures can be transformed, that rejections are not the end, and that there can be a greater truth that breaks into our world, that ends division, that unites us, and that sets our hearts, our souls our minds, and our beings free. So may we be Easter people that bear the mark of rejection, but know what it is to be laid as a cornerstone and to be built into the living house of God. May we be that witness. Amen.